Okay, uh, just give me a second. So, all right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for staying this late on a Monday night. Um, so, I'll try to make it quick. I'll try to make it a bit more interesting for everyone. Um, so, what I'm talking about today is quite a new initiative in um, over here at WeGo. So, previously, um, everyone who might be an engineer might know what cron is. So, it's something to schedule repeated tasks and on a remote server. So, recently, we have been experimenting with Apache Airflow. And this is something that we are currently moving towards. So just some of the background. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Daniel. Uh, I'm a lead engineer with uh, WeGo. So I'm together with the content tools and services team. So what we do is to create and manage tools uh, used by internal and external stakeholders. So one of the goals is basically to make uh, um, our stakeholders' lives easier. And once people are able to work with uh, more simplistic tools or an easier, um, easier way to interact with uh, their products, they are able to move faster. So some of the background um, of why we decided to move away from cron. So okay, over here we go, we run a lot of data related tasks on GCP. So all these tasks are generally independent. They don't rely on each other on, uh, for code or for them to run in sequence. So a lot of things include uh, data transformation processing. So as uh, Asan has mentioned, we have a lot of data coming in. Um, the data team focuses on making um, any kind of um, business-related um, analysis based on this data. So we also do things like ETL from, um, from third-party services. So sometimes we have to ping different APIs. Uh, sometimes we receive data dumps through S3. And we basically want to get into BigQuery, for example. So another thing that we do is that on BigQuery, we can query the raw data and basically create um, um, resulting tables from that that sometimes we just use um, directly with uh, our, our visualization tools to be able to um, display for the, for the business people. So sometimes we also send data to the party services. So right now we collect all this data and um, some of these third-party services require us to send some data over. So the idea is that um, all, these, uh, all these tasks are very independent. They handle a lot of different things, and they need to be quite flexible. So the, one of the common points is that they're mainly written in Python. Our data team mainly works with Python, and um, it requires scheduling. So um, for example, if we have a cleaning script that runs maybe once every day, once every hour, so we need something to be stable, to run on a recurring schedule. And sometimes they also require credentials. So for example, if I'm making a call to an API, um, I will need to store this credential securely. <coughs> so right, I'm going to be running through what a naive approach might look like when it comes to doing these tasks. So you think, OK, you know, it's fairly simple. It's just a bunch of scripts. You just need to dump in the server. So let's just start with a single instance. You have a single code repo. And basically, you have a shared Python environment. So you dump your code, you dump everything into a single repo, and you share something like Anaconda, for example. And you schedule it with cron. So it's something that you can schedule maybe every day, every hour. And you know, in a really naive approach, you might be uh, storing your credentials in plain text on your repo. Please don't. Or maybe it might be defined or encrypted. Uh, on the same repo. So uh, it's less of a big oh no, but still it's not great. And you might um, create these instances by manually going and deploying and provisioning your stuff. So OK, let's break it down. When it comes to setting up a brand new server, how would that look like? You create an instance from the UI. You would SSH into the instance. You install the system dependencies. Maybe it's a Linux instance. You're just doing an app get based on whatever you need. You install Anaconda for your shared Python environment. 
you copy your git ssh keys over because you need to eventually clone the repo. So this is how a naive approach will look like when it comes to um, provisioning. So when it comes to deployment, deployment is a bit of a stretch when it comes to the naive approach because you are basically just updating your code, pulling it into the server, and um, basically you update CronTap when, uh, when you're done with that. So what's wrong with this approach? Um, if anyone has any kind of um, experience doing something like this, I guess, you know, everyone has to start somewhere. Like, you know, it's not uncommon that uh, smaller teams, smaller companies might have taken this approach. But very quickly, you realize that there's a bunch of problems associated with this. So, okay, we have a bunch of concerns. So the first thing is that we, uh, we have an issue with reproducibility. So let's say our worker goes down. That single instance goes down, it's nearly impossible to be able to reproduce the environment that this instance was, um, was running on when it went down. Both on the system dependency side, because you're manually going in and installing all the dependencies you want. And also on the Python dependencies. So, um, I mean, since this is PyData, maybe you guys are familiar with Python. If you go in, you pip install stuff. If you do not have any kind of reference to reproduce this environment, you're in trouble. So the next thing is that you have an issue with isolation. Since you're sharing a Python um, environment, let's say with Anaconda, whatever you install, maybe just for one of the tasks, would affect um, the running of maybe another task. So for example, if you have package A, package B, but they share a common dependency, package C. If let's say you upgrade package A, um, package B will be affected. So something unrelated to your currently running tasks would be affected. And you have security issues as well. So um, credentials management, you have to worry about how um, to make sure that these credentials are not in plain text firstly, and how to basically um, be able to safely manage all these uh, very you know, tricky, tricky issues when it comes to uh, credential management. So next thing is about SSH keys, because assuming that you're using um, SSH keys with Git, if let's say you put it on your server manually, um, you somehow have to make sure that this is not exposed to the world. So the next thing is that when you want to grant users access to get into your server, you will need to manage all these credentials as well. So the user SSH access. So the next thing is about scheduling. So what's wrong with cron? Cron is great. I mean, it's on most of the uh, distributions, but you would have some issues with it. So for example, if you have scheduled a job for uh, every hour, but let's say one of um, the hours, your job takes one and a half hours to run. So then you have run into some concurrency, uh, concurrency issues, because these two tasks uh, might cause issues if they overlap. So the next thing we have to worry about is logging. <clears throat> By taking a naive approach, all the logs that your task generates is going to reside on your instance itself. And there's very little ways to uh, find out what went wrong unless you went into the server itself to take a look. So something that most people might not think about is resource starvation. So if, let's say, I need to install a new package. Um, and I go into this, uh, the instance, which is running a very heavy task. If, let's say, I install a new package, it takes up um, resources that might be needed um, by the tasks that are currently running. So um, this might cause the task to fail, or maybe the instance might crash. So um, based on these things, we, uh, I kind of like divided up into three major categories uh, of what kind of problem this is. So the first one is a process problem. It can be solved with DevOps. It can be solved with a better process. The next thing is about how we design our project. And finally, it's about the program specific, uh, specifically that's running this. So, um, so based on this, um, this is kind of um, how we decided to classify these issues. And based on this, we can come up with um, solutions that meets uh, these three problem categories. So basically, the goal when uh, we came in to try to redesign this system is that we wanted to make everything uh, reproducible, define everything as code. So like what Tian mentioned, um, one of the only ways that we can 
um, we can move as fast as we do is that we try to define everything as code. So that, uh, for example, if the instance goes down, we are able to immediately bring it up because we have defined it as code. So when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to instance provisioning, so even the CI CD uh, pipeline, we also want to, uh, we also want to um, define everything as code. So this is something that um, is new for us as well. Because previously we were sharing the dependencies, what we want to do now is to define the individual tasks, Python dependencies as code as well. So scheduling. We need it to be stable and easy to use. We, um, one of the issues that we face was that um, we weren't, um, when, when it came to all these random tasks all running at once on a single instance, we didn't have a lot of insight into what was going on. Uh, when things failed, we couldn't really tell. So we wanted something to be rock solid and stable. And more importantly, easy to use. Because when it comes to the users of these tools, um, they, are, uh, they might not be like, you know, um, full-fledged engineers. They might be people from the data team. They might be people from marketing but just want to run some tasks on a remote server. So scalability is nice, but it's not at the forefront when it came to designing the system. So I wanted to remove most of the manual interaction. You don't have to go in, uh, SSH in the server, and basically like, you know, tweak things. A nice UI is always nice. <coughs> so okay, the first thing that we probably want to talk about is uh, maybe dive a bit deeper into what we mean by infrastructure as code. So this is a stack that uh, we use uh, over here at WeGo. When it comes to instance provisioning, we are using Packer together with Ansible. So what this means is that um, we are able to uh, create a machine image with uh, everything installed. So we're using Ansible for that, and we're using Packer to create machine images based on the same code base. So for example, if we need to create a Docker container, we can use that. If we want to create um, um, an AWS AMI, a machine image for AWS, machine image for Google Cloud, we can use pretty much uh, the exact same code base to generate that. So when it comes to infrastructure management, so instances are not the only bit when it comes to our infrastructure. We also have other supporting infrastructure, such as databases, such as load balancers, and all these things, they need to be autom automated somehow as well. So we use Terraform for this. <clears throat> when it comes to deployment and automation, uh, we are using Jenkins. Um, more specifically, we're using Jenkins pipelines and job DSL. So this allows you to basically create everything from scratch. So um, <clears throat> let's say we spin up a brand new Jenkins instance. Um, we need to create the jobs that would run um, maybe for certain specific tasks. So all these can be defined as code uh, using um, Jenkins pipeline and job DSL. And um, for, for deployment, we also use Ansible. So OK, let's come back to the architectural components that support Airflow. <coughs> so we have an instance called the Builder. So what the Builder is is that um, it controls the deployment as well as uh, the automation involved. So it's kind of the brains is the key point of interaction. Um, and it's basically a Jenkins server that uses Ansible for automation as well as deployment. So OK, the start of the show, Airflow. So this is our scheduler. Um, it focuses on um, recurring tasks as well as uh, monitoring those tasks that have run. And finally, we have the worker, which is a very humble, um, basic instance that only has runtime dependencies. So the key thing is that we are using pip env. So for those who are uh, familiar with um, the issues concerning dependency management in Python, one of the key things is basically um, without pip env, you uh, are always left um, not knowing what actually is installed. So even if you define something like a requirements txt, that say that, OK, I'm going to lock down this top level version at version 1. But um, the underlying dependencies might still shift. So something that um, pip env solves is that it gives you an absolute certainty when it comes to reproducible environments. So for those of you who haven't checked out pip env, it's a great project. Uh, do check it out. <clears throat> so now, OK, we have explained these three components. How do they interact? 
um, we have our job repo, we have our schedules repo. So we split these two up, basically, since they um, contain different uh, information, and it might be easier to uh, extend. So our job repo contains all our code of the tasks that need to run. The schedules repo contain um, the airflow schedules. So, um, OK, I'll go into a bit more detail about what exactly the airflow schedules are. But um, their terminology is that they're called DAX, Directed Acyclic Graphs. So, OK, just keep that in mind first. So Jenkins will do two things. It would build the virtual environment uh, using pip env and deploy the code to the worker. Jenkins would then also transfer the schedule files to Airflow. So the way that uh, Airflow would interact with the worker is through SSH. So there's something called the SSH operator that allows you to run code remotely. <coughs> so this is an example of um, our Jenkins pipeline job that uh, used for deploying, deploying code. So as you can see, um, we are able to define the branch that we want to deploy. We are also able to define the tasks I want to deploy. Since all these are pretty much independent tasks, um, you are able to uh, define which task you want to deploy. And basically, that code um, would be packaged up and just sent over to the worker. So essentially, what it does is that it pulls the latest code from Git. It builds the virtual environment, uh, vir virtual environment from the pitfall and the pitfall lock using pip env. And finally, it will copy code and virtual environments to the worker using Ansible. Actually, it's not finally. Finally, it templates the credentials using Ansible Vault. So Ansible Vault is um, the encryption program that we use to keep all our credentials safe. So when it, we, um, we, uh, whenever we deploy something, this will be decrypted, and it will be made available to be templated. So this is a visual represent representation of um, a specific task that we're running. So the first thing it does is that it gives it a clean slate. It cleans the, workplace, uh, the workspace. It checks out the latest version of the source code. Um, then based on um, that input, we can specify one or many tasks that we want to build. So the first thing that it does when the task is being built is that in, it creates the virtual environment. So initially, we were talking about um, uh, resource starvation. If, let's say, we install um, or we create the virtual environment on the worker itself. Um, so this helps to avoid that case, because we are creating the virtual environment on the builder, which is entirely separate from the worker. So the worker can just focus on running the task. The builder can focus on doing what it does best, building. So we built the Python environments. And finally, it will be using Ansible to deploy everything that we need. <coughs> so when it comes to the worker, it's super bare bones. It only needs the runtime dependencies. So because of the way that we have structured our infrastructure, um, by having the builder, the uh, worker, and Airflow separate, um, we are actually able to scale out the number of workers that we want. And uh, for example, if it goes down, we can always recreate it without any disruption. <clears throat> so right, um, when it comes to Airflow, what exactly is Airflow? We are able to uh, define a sequence of tasks, um, defined as Python code, um, and they call it DAX. So what DAX are, uh, they are directed acyclic graphs. So all that means is that you can, um, you can basically have any kind of like, tree-like sequence of tasks. As long as it doesn't loop back on itself, it's fine. So uh, it's, always, it's always in relation to, for example, its parents. So things can run in sequence. Things can run in parallel. <coughs> so there's a cron-like scheduler. So since we are moving away from cron and we are familiar with cron, we like this cron syntax. So it's not too far removed from what we know. So things like concurrency controls, they can be set per deck. If I only want one to be running at one time, um, it can be such that um, the rest of the jobs will be queued up after it. So this is a huge step up from what cron is, because cron is not aware of the currently running task. <coughs> so for example, we have real-time logs uh, that are viewable on the UI. So everyone likes a good UI. We can actually see um, the progress of the jobs as they are running. And one of the nice things is that there's inbuilt support for backfill. 
So if let's say um, I have said that uh, maybe this task is supposed to start on the 1st of July, and um, the server was down for a couple of days, and it finally comes up on the 5th, what uh, Airflow can do is that it can backfill for those days that it missed out on. And of course, you can turn it on or off. So okay, this is the first bit of code that we've seen. So okay, it's a bit small, um, but this is basically um, a snippet of code directly from uh, the documentation that explains what a DAG is. So the bits that you probably might want to look out for is over here. So when a DAG is created, <coughs> so as you can see, this one is very familiar to Python users because it's basically Python. You just have to create a DAG, which is um, like a job. So within this job, you have to assign tasks to it. So in this case, there are three tasks, T1, T2, and T3. And what happens inside the task is not very important, but each of them are handling a single thing. And finally, as you can see at the bottom, T2, which is task 2, is setting its upstream to task 1, and T3 is setting its upstream to task 1 as well. So what this means is that task 1 will run first, then task 2 and task 3 will run in parallel. So this is extremely powerful. People are able to build super complex graphs based on this because it's all about just a relationship between the tasks they have to run. So one of the great things is that, for example, if all these things need to run um, in this sequence, if task 1 fails, task 2 and task 3 won't run. So this is a huge, um, this is a huge lifesaver when it comes to making sure that um, your prerequisites have been met first before moving on to the next task. So okay, since we have talked about the relationship between the builder and the worker, now we're talking about the relationship between the builder and the scheduler. So this is an extremely simple job of basically just taking the, the schedules and loading it into the Airflow, uh, Airflow server. So it just pulls the latest code from the task schedules and it syncs it to GCS, then into the scheduler. So that's all. It's just, um, <coughs> just checking out the latest code and loading it into GCS and then into Airflow. So the reason why we load it into GCS is because um, using Ansible, there's a special cron command that uh, would allow you to pull, uh, to run anything uh, on restart. So uh, what that means is that if, let's say, we recreate the Airflow server, we are able to just take the latest state of whatever we have loaded the Airflow server and just replicate it. <coughs> so this is how the scheduler looks like. Um, we have different decks, and each of them have different tasks within them. And they all can run separately. So we can see, uh, based on the very visual interface, on uh, what has run, when it ran, and even have a breakdown on uh, what of the in which of the individual tasks have run and how long it took. <coughs> so the scheduler automatically loads these decks once we have synced them over. And we are using the SSH operator to basically communicate between the worker and um, the scheduler. So that's how uh, we are able to trigger jobs remotely. So yeah, I mean, this is um, basically how it looks like. Uh, if you guys are interested in looking at some of the code that we have or having a live demonstration, um, yeah, you know, I'm open to doing it right now. So, um, so maybe I can just show how it looks like. OK, let me just. So, right. so this is how Airflow looks like, basically. So we can see all the previously run tasks. So okay, this is one of um, the particular tasks that we have, that, um, that we are running right now. So uh, for this, there's something really sensitive. It's basically getting data from, um, um, from raw data dump uh, in S3, based on one of our third-party providers. And uh, we basically need to sync it over uh, into our internal systems every day. <coughs> so in this case, um, the way that we have structured this task is that it does three things. Firstly, it checks to see where the data, data is in S3, because that's where the data is. 
And then it performs um, the sync between S3 and GCS, and finally it loads in the BigQuery. So the great thing about this is that it's perfect fit for Airflow, because um, this data is beyond our control. We don't know when exactly it will come into S3. So um, for this particular case, um, we have seen that data comes in from 12 noon all the way until 4 p.m., so it can come in any time. So what, this, what happens is that we have set up this task to um, start at 12 noon, but if, let's say, the S3 check fails, we have set up um, 10 retries, half an hourly. So um, basically every half an hour, if let's say the check fails, uh, you just wait half an hour, then after that, uh, you try again. So uh, we don't have to worry um, whether the task will run when the data in S3 is not complete. So it's going to just keep checking, checking, until finally the check passes, then you move on to the next step to sync it over, and finally to load it in the BigQuery. So this was one of those use cases that was, uh, was really quite well um, quite well suited for, S, uh, for, for Airflow. So all these kind of small tricks uh, can be done just because of all the inbuilt features for Airflow. Is this a free check itself for Python script or a small Python script? Yes. Um, so once again, it comes down to... So this is basically how the Python script is done. So it's three separate commands um, over here. So it just runs uh, S3 check. You can run GCS, S3 GC, uh, GCS sync, and low bakery. So even though they all have the same entry point, may not py, they uh, can run as different commands. So you can think of them as just three separate commands. Um, yeah. So this can run basically anything. Um, you can run Python. You can run uh, Bash if you want to. Since this is going through an SSH operator, so it's just running um, anything on a remote system. Sorry, I'm not sure what RP is. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. No, it's not. Uh, there's, um, there's a server that runs this. So there are two components when it comes to Airflow. There's a web server and there's a scheduler as well. So um, to be able to see the UI, um, you basically have to run that process. And the scheduler is the one that kicks off the job. It does its own calculation to find out whether you have passed a certain interval whether to run a job. So of course you can run things manually, but the power of this is that you are able to schedule things in a cron like fashion. No. It's, uh, it's part of Airflow. Yeah. So like, for example, in Airflow here, if let's say we just take a look here. So this is the schedule. It runs at 4.30. One thing to note is that uh, all this is in UTC. So um, it's recommended, at least in this version of Airflow, to stick to UTC. But I mean, it's just a small inconvenience. <coughs> so right, uh, any questions for anyone? Yes. Mm. Mm. Uh, cannot be resolved with pip freeze. So it's more like, for example, if I install, um, I can't think of any specific example, but. Uh, mm. Mm. A common package. Mm. In this case, uh, it's more like um, it shouldn't, OK. What happens is that um, at least for each of our tasks, we have their own um, pitfall and pitfall lock. So it's quite rare that um, you would install two different packages that have some kind of conflicting underlying dependency. Because no one is sharing, for example, if I have uh, task A and task B, uh, we purposely separate them out such that um, um, if, let's say, they handle different things, they would just be completely isolated. So um, when it comes to, yeah, so one of the issues that we had was uh, on a lot of uh, packages like OAuth 2. So that has caused uh, a lot of grief for us because um, certain, a lot of the clients that we're using uh, need that common package. And there's a lot of breaking changes between version 2 and version 4. So that was a huge pain point. Um, 
with a lot of other packages, they lock the top level dependencies, but they let the bottom, like the underlying dependencies shift. So uh, just having a requirements TXT um, would not be fully reproducible. So the only way to do it is through pip environment. So it's really been a godsend. Um, no. Yes. So it's not so much of the recurrence. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Um, previously, it was all shared. So, yeah. So it's, there's no way around it if everything is shared. So the way that uh, we work is that there is a um, task folder and everything below that are individual tasks. So they will never communicate with each other. They will each have their own uh, pitfall and pitfall lock. So like in this case, for example, uh, I only have these things. So I don't have to worry about these things shifting or someone installing something that would have a different um, underlying dependency. Um, Ansible is more of an automation tool. It's, Docker is different from Ansible. So I mean, um, when it comes to... Mm. Oh. So Docker is not... Um, okay, let's go back. So when it comes to this slide, so we use Ansible for two different things. We use Ansible, um, firstly, to provision our instances. So you can actually use Ansible instead of a Docker file uh, to create a Docker container. So um, the, one of the benefits is that uh, it's a lot more configurable. And if you're using Ansible together with Packer, you can use the same Ansible code to create um, something that's not a Docker file. You can, um, you can create maybe um, a Google Cloud image. You can create uh, an AMI. So um, that's, one, yeah, that's one of the cases that we use Ansible for. Another one is to communicate between already deployed uh, instances. So like, for example, the worker. So um, the builder is a separate instance from the worker. We want to get uh, some stuff, configuration, some code from the builder to the worker, we use Ansible. So it can run locally, it can run remotely as well. So they serve two different functions. <coughs> All right. Any other questions? Oh, um, Ansible and Airflow. Uh, Airflow does not run Ansible. Uh, Airflow uses um, basically there is uh, an internal. There's some internal functionality to uh, run SSH commands. So um, Ansible is used together with Jenkins. Um, just as a bit of automation. So it's a bit of glue to get, some, uh, to get the code into the worker, to get the um, schedules into Airflow. So Airflow itself does not uh, run Ansible. It just uses its, um, you can check it out, the SSH operator. So there are different operators, like for example, a uh, bash operator. We can run bash commands locally on the Airflow server itself. You can run Python commands as well. So there's a Python operator. So uh, the one that we chose to run uh, to be, since it's, uh, we need to run on a remote server, uh, we use the SSH operator. Um, one of the limitations, at least in this setup, uh, since we're using SSH, is that uh, we need to define ahead of time uh, where it should be running on. There's no automatic load balancing um, or like automatic uh, service discovery. Um, if you're looking out for that, there is actually a salary operator. So you can run uh, salary jobs. Um, 
you can also they just uh, release a Kubernetes operator. So it's really, really new. Uh, I'm not sure whether anyone's using it in production yet, but you can check it out. So um, instead of pointing directly into an, uh, another instance, uh, you can use one of these uh, distributed software or distributed frameworks to run jobs um, automatically and scale out, scale out automatically. For now, okay, it's getting into production. So um, at least uh, based on our, our experiments, it's quite stable. It's been running fine. Um, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of small... Um, hmm. It's incubating. Yeah. Um, the thing is, it's okay. I think a bunch of people are running in production. Um, if you're looking for something more stable and you're on Google Cloud, they uh, have Composer. So it's managed airflow. Um, but in the end, if uh, we wanted something to be a bit more flexible, because we are thinking of using this not just on Google Cloud, but also on AWS. So if this pays off, we can actually uh, run a whole bunch of other tasks on AWS as well. But so far, I mean, it's, it's been fine. Uh, we are slowly migrating some stuff into production. Um, but yeah, it's been, maybe ask me in a month's time and see whether I regret my decision. But yeah, I mean, so far it's fine. Um, so far, not that I know of. Um, the the resource usage is quite moderate. So I mean, it's not uh, it's not like really uh, eating away at everything just by uh, just by scheduling jobs. So that's one of the reasons why we broke up um, the builder and the scheduler and the worker into three separate sets of instances. So we'll just have one dedicated builder, one dedicated scheduler. If anything goes down, we can just spin up a new, um, for example, Airflow server with a, with a bigger, um, bigger memory capacity or like, uh, just more cores. Um, there is an option in built to send you an email uh, on retry, on failure. Um, but since no one uses emails anymore, you can actually uh, just look at the UI. I think that's a way to alert you on Slack uh, if something fails. Um, you can um, set things like uh, the retries on the deck level. So if uh, it's going to be a one-off error, then it can retry by itself. If not, um, yeah, there should be some, there should be some ways in there to let you know. But for now, we just monitor the UI. If anything fails, right now it's daily jobs. So uh, we put in retries as well. Um, if anything fails, normally it's just a hiccup. So maybe it's just an intermittent failure. So just retry by itself and usually be fixed. All right. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, I have never tried it before, but maybe maybe you can. Um, they have quite a lot of uh, plugins, so um, even if let's say something doesn't really meet your needs, you, it's just Python code. You can uh, create your own operator to send out whatever messages you want. So it, it's quite flexible. You can even send out um, HTTP requests. Uh, maybe if you need to trigger something on a remote server, uh, you can as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do with it, but I think we we'll only just scratch the surface. So uh, maybe in a while we'll try out all these fancy things. All right. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks.